we want to generate the machine code for this function call. The question is how to pass arguments and get back the return value. What options do we have? We can try to use memory or registers. Since memory is much much slower, we will try to get by with registers. The most straightforward way would be to have the agreement, each function should expect its arguments to be in the registers. So if we want to call this function, we should put arguments to registers R0 and R1 and do the branch instruction. And again, the machine code of the function foo expects us to do that. This kind of agreement is called a calling convention. For ARM processors, we can find its comprehensive description on the ARM website. And it specifies that the first two arguments should be in R0 and R1 registers, just like we have discussed. Now we know how to pass arguments and the full function just adds values from R0 and R1. But how to return the result back to the main function? Let's ask the calling convention again. We should use R0 for that. Now the foo function moves the addition result to R0 and jumps back to the main function with pxlr. Yes, the idea of using registers for arguments and results is quite straightforward, but the calling convention brings something important to the table. It helps all the compilers to generate compatible machine code. If two libraries are built with different compilers, the first library can still call the functions from the second one because both of them follow the same rules to handle arguments. Let's revisit the calling convention. The first four registers are used to pass arguments to the function. But what if the function has more arguments or big ones? The convention says that we need to use the stack for that. Quick reminder. Stack is a classic last-in, first-out data structure. The CPU has two special instructions to work with stack push and pop. In the previous episode we used it to support nested functions. From now, for our convenience, another CPU register is used to track the position of the current stack top. R13 is used for that and now we will call it stack pointer. In red you see the area in memory allocated for the stack. Each time the CPU executes a push or pop instruction, it automatically changes the stack pointer accordingly. But the usefulness of keeping the stack pointer into the register is that we can access or rewrite anything in the stack with regular memory operations load and store. Or we can manually shift the stack pointer. So again, why do we even need it this time? The problem is the same. Consider this function, and it declares the array of 20 elements. We don't have enough registers to handle this. So we need some place in memory to keep this array. Not a big deal. We can pick some memory area and say that each time function foo is called, it can use this place in memory to keep 20 elements of the array. The problem is again nested calls. Foo can call another function and that another function can call foo again. With all the C++ virtual functions and similar features of other languages, we cannot predict it at the compile time. Since there is only one place in memory for the foo function to keep the array, the second foo function will use the same piece of memory and will overwrite all the data there. And when we return back to the first foo function, it will find its array completely corrupted. To our pleasure, stack is a very simple way to get over this problem. Each time a function is called, it reserves all the necessary area in the stack by simply moving the stack pointer. If a nested call happens, the new foo function will reserve its own area in the stack by doing the same. Before returning, each function restores the stack pointer. We don't need to clean up the used area in the stack. We can clean it up, but we don't want to waste CPU cycles for that. Next time some function uses this area, it will anyway put its own data there. Only moving back the stack pointer is enough. So when we get back to the first foo function, the stack pointer is restored to the correct value, and the foo function can access its own reserved area. What does the machine code of the foo function look like? The average function looks like this. At the very beginning, one of the first instructions allocates stack area by moving the stack pointer with subtract instruction. 
and in the end, right before the return instruction, the function restores the stack pointer back by adding the same shift. Now back to function arguments. If we have too many of them, we have to use the stack to pass them forward. We have two options. Option 1 is to reserve a bit more area in the color function and put arguments there. Option 2 is to put all the arguments beyond the current stack pointer, so that they live in the Kali stack frame. Technically, they both could work, but some platforms like Linux can use the area beyond the stack pointer to handle POSIX signals, so we can't use option 2. However, some platforms want option 2 to work. For instance, Apple's ARM64 has a 128 bytes red zone, and they guarantee that this zone will never be used by any platform code. And it is safe to use option 2 if we are not exceeding the red zone. There is one more important thing in the calling convention. Foo function uses some registers, let's say R7. After that it calls the bar function. And when the bar function is done, foo function uses the value in R7 again. But what if the bar function has used the R7 as well and has changed it? The foo function doesn't have any mechanism to detect that. And foo will use the corrupted value in R7. What to do? Calling convention has the answer. If the bar function uses R7, it is the bar's responsibility to save the old value of R7 to the stack and restore it before returning. Hmm, you can say that this situation is very close to what we had in the previous episode with the link register, and you are right, it is exactly the same. Let's fix this problem in our machine code. We know that the bar function will use R7. So we should preserve its old value with push instruction and restore it back right before returning. So, according to calling convention, each function has to preserve the old values of the registers from R4 to R11, along with the ring register. But why not R0 to R3? The answer is simple. Since the foo function is supposed to pass arguments with them, it is foo function's job to preserve their old values. R12 is a bit more tricky, it is supposed to be kinda a global register, but we will not discuss it now. So, each function has to preserve R4 to R11 and the link register if any of those are used, and the color function may need to preserve R0 to R3. What we have as a result? Each function expects its arguments in registers or in the stack, if there are too many of them. If there are too many local variables, the function can use the memory area in the stack to keep them, and this area is usually reserved by moving the stack pointer with subtract and add instructions. Each function has to preserve R4 to R11 and the link register into the stack and restore the old value before returning. Preserving of R0 to R3 is up to the caller function. 